Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for what is the ADPKD gene variant database and what are we learning from it? I'm Elise Hoover, and I'll be introducing our speaker in just a moment. Next slide, please. First, let me just note that the PKD Foundation does not offer medical advice, and the information shared during this webinar is not intended to be a substitute for conversations with your healthcare provider. Care and treatment decisions related to your health must be made in consult with your healthcare team. Next slide. So I'm delighted to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Peter Harris. The research laboratory of Dr. Harris focuses on genetic diseases of the kidney, especially PKD. Dr. Harris's research group previously identified the major gene for the common autosomal dominant PKD and the gene for autosomal recessive PKD. More recently, they identified two genes for the syndromic PKD, Meckel syndrome, and two minor ADPKD-like genes. In these disorders, Dr. Harris's studies are focused on screening for disease-causing mutations and other variants that can modify the phenotype. By employing genotype and phenotype studies, he is determining the extent to which the variability in disease presentation and progression is explained by simple genetic factors. Dr. Harris's research is funded by the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. He is Associate Director of the Mayo Translational PKD Center, which coordinates PKD research activities at Mayo Clinic. He also hosts the PKD Foundation-funded ADPKD Mutation Database, which describes more than 2,000 variants to the ADPKD genes, and which we'll be hearing about now. So welcome, Dr. Harris, and I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. So I was going to talk about some uh, recent developments in uh, genetics and, um, and, and show you a little bit about how the PKD Foundation database is helpful for learning more about uh, genetics of uh, ADPKD. So hopefully today we're going to learn a little bit more about when genetic testing might be helpful in ADPKD, uh, to understanding what uh, genetic test results tell us uh, about uh, the PKD patient's uh, uh, cause of the disease and the uh, progression, and learn more about the PKD uh, Foundation funded uh, ADPKD uh, gene variant database and how it's helping us to understand the causes of PKD and prospects for treatment. So just to start a few uh, basic terms about genetics, and some of these you're probably aware of, uh, a chromosome. So we have 46 chromosomes, 20, uh, so um, 22 of these are uh, non-sex chromosomes or autosomes, where the name autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease comes from. And then two, uh, two are sex chromosomes, with males being XY and females being XX. And we have two copies of each of these chromosomes, one from the mother and one from the father. The genes are uh, what um, dictates the, the proteins that make our body. And we have about 21,500 of these genes uh, decorated on our, our chromosomes. And DNA is what these chromosomes and the genes are uh, made of. And uh, this is made up of um, um, a twisted uh, structure here, as you can see, a double helix, uh, where the actual coding sequences, the thymine, cytosine, guanine, uh, uh, are in the middle and adenine are in the middle of here. And you can see A binds with T and C binds with G. And so it's a coding molecule. This splits in half and to make another one, we'd uh, make another strand exactly like the, the other one with these binding pairs. And the genome is all of the DNA that we have on the chromosomes and all of the genes. And we have about 6 billion base pairs of DNA, and each one of these is a single base pair. And this will be about two meters long or six and a half feet long. So the, the, the paradigm we have here is that our genes are encoded in our DNA. They're turned into messenger RNA. And we've heard a lot about messenger RNA recently from messenger RNA vaccines, where the messenger RNA is uh, injected as part of the vaccine and makes the protein. In our case, the PKD protein we're interested 
in the in the vaccine case than the uh, the spike protein on the outside of the the um, that's on the outside of the vaccine on the outside of the virus. So let's talk a, bit, a little bit about genes. This is a, a, a typical structure for a, a gene here. It's about 27,000 of these base pairs. Uh, it's made up of pieces that code for a protein in the end and are, are incorporated into the messenger RNA and pieces that are taken out, these intronic regions. So uh, somewhat um, set up in a, in a fairly complicated way in our, in our genomes. And so we're interested in variants that occur, especially within these coding regions and these uh, borders between the coding and the intronic regions, as these are the ones that often cause genetic diseases. So uh, if we think about the cause of genetic disease and a bit more genetic background, we have two copies of each chromosome and each gene in our genome, one inherited from our father and one from our mother. The DNA is copied uh, when cells divide or they're transcribed to make the protein via the messenger RNA. And this is usually when the mistakes happen can, that can lead to the disease. However, most of the mistakes happen. A lot of them are corrected. There's a lot of systems for correcting. And a lot of them are non-consequential. They're called polymorphisms. So these spelling mistakes are allowed. However, sometimes a pathogenic variant, a misspelling occurs that can cause a disease like ADPKD. So by sequencing these coding parts of the genome, uh, we can uh, try to work out what the cause of the ADPKD is in any particular patient. These days we use uh, a method called next generation sequencing and either whole exome or targeted panels to do this sequencing. So basically we capture the pieces of the, the patient's uh, DNA which encode for the genes that we're interested in, either all of the genes in the genome or the ones that are known to be associated with polycystic kidney disease. And then we sequence them to try and find uh, mistakes in this sequence. So let's think a little bit about uh, genetic testing. You know, why is genetic testing helpful in ADPKD? And uh, as your nephrologist has probably often told you, uh, ADPKD can often be diagnosed uh, by kid kidney imaging. So often it's thought that uh, genetic testing is, is not that helpful. But I'm going to go through these different points on the slide here and show you some examples where I think uh, uh, genetic testing can be of value. So I won't go through it all in one here. I'll try and pull out each of the individual parts and then show you an illustration of that. But first, we'll just talk about ADPKD. I'm going to talk about ADPKD today because these are the variants that are in the ADPKD uh, variant database. Uh, but this type of genetic screening is uh, also can be used to identify uh, the pathogenic changes in ARPKD or other rare forms of uh, PKD. ADPKD, as you know, is a, a common disease. About one in a thousand individuals are affected, maybe one in 2,000 individuals who reaching uh, who will develop end-stage renal disease. So about four to 10% of people uh, with renal transplant or dialysis around the world have this disease in the US. It's about 4.9%. 14% of the, the patients at Mayo who are transplanted have ADPKD. This is an adult onset disease that develops over the lifetime of the patient. And uh, uh, an average age of um, requiring dialysis or transplant is 61.5 years. But as you probably know, it's quite variable. And this is a slowly progressive disease where cysts continually develop and expand.
So why do we call it a dominant uh, polycystic kidney disease? We call it dominant because a single change, and it's shown in blue here, and in this case, it's coming from the father who has ADPKD, is then inherited to the son here and the daughter. And just the inheritance of this one copy of the gene is sufficient to cause polycystic kidney disease. In the recessive disease, we would need a variant from both parents who would normally be unaffected. And then on average, only one in four of the children would uh, uh, develop uh, uh, ARPKD. But in this situation, uh, on average, half of the children will inherit the, um, the, the, the variant and develop um, ADPKD. So for the first thing, we, it, the genetic testing can provide a firm diagnosis. And uh, so it identifies which gene is involved and the pathogenic uh, variant that is causative of the disease. So PKD1 and PKD2 are the major ADPKD genes. PKD1 is shown at the top here and PKD2 at the bottom. PKD1 is a really very large gene. It has a coding region of about 12,000 base pairs. I told you that an average gene is about, 10 is about tenfold less si in size than that. It also lies in a complicated part of the genome so that uh, uh, this part of the gene is, is copied uh, six times elsewhere in the genome that makes study of the gene a little bit more difficult. PKD2 is a more average gene, about average size here. Um, with a, a 3KB um, open reading for, or coding region. ADPKD1 accounts for about 78% of ADPKD, PKD2 about 15%. And of the 7%, there are ones where we haven't found the, uh, the variant, another gene is involved, or there may be other genetic complexity. And I'll, I'll go into some details of some of these cases. The, uh, these genes then encode proteins, the polycystin-1 protein shown here and the polycystin-2 proteins. These two proteins uh, form a complex, which is thought to be involved with uh, calcium transport. And the site of these proteins is thought to be on the, the primary cilium. So this is a little extension or a little antenna that we find sticking out of most cells in the body and has important uh, signaling functions, which we think the polycystins are involved in. So I mentioned that there were some other rare causes of ADPKD, and there here's a few examples of these, uh, GANAB, where we have just a few cysts in the kidney, some usually, although liver cysts are quite common in this uh, particular cause of uh, ADPKD. DNA JB11, in this case, the kidneys usually stay quite small and the cysts are quite small, but patients tend to have uh, to um, require dialysis or transplantation at an older age, something similar to uh, PKD2. ALG8 is also mainly a fairly mild form of, of PKD, but it seems that some patients do uh, require transplant or dialysis. And ALG8, which is only in published literature has been associated with polycystic liver disease, we think can also cause a polycystic kidney disease, but again, usually fairly mild. And probably these loci altogether account for one or 2% of of other cases not accounted for by PKD1 or PKD2. So why should we do the genetic testing? It provides information that can aid diagnostics in the family, especially helpful in a, uh, in a, for a negative family history. And also it can help in transplant decisions. For instance, if you're considering having a, a living related donor, it can determine that that person for certain doesn't have uh, ADPKD. When we have the situation of a negative family history, and I'll show you that this is not that uncommon, uh, I'll show you the consequences of the de novo change and mosaicism.
So this is a, a, a pedigree of a family. So this is uh, the mother and the father. These are the children. Uh, the the colored in, in um, shapes here are individuals that are affected with ADPKD, and the un, these are unaffected ones. And in this family, we can see that the mother has ADPKD and three of the children, but none of the mother's siblings or the parents have ADPKD. So a, a new variant causing the disease might have occurred in the mother here. And this is not that unusual in ADPKD, probably 10 to 20% of families can be linked to these uh, new mutations. One thing that can happen in these cases is that the new variant doesn't occur in the egg or the sperm. Uh, if, it, if it happened there, it will be found in every cell in the body, but it occurs at a later stage, like at the four cell stage here. And then the parent becomes a uh, uh, patient becomes a mosaic of uh, cells that have the variant and ones that are, are normal. Uh, and the consequences of that is um, that the the disease may be uh, less severe than is normally the case. We, tw we uh, published a study of 20 families with mosaicism uh, last year. In this case, this is uh, the mosaic individual, and then the, uh, the, the pathogenic variant has been transmitted to the son in this case. You can see the imaging in the mother. They're somewhat atypical for ADPKD with these very large cysts and still a lot of good parenchyma in the, in the kidney at 47. But you can see in the son, there's more, multiple small cysts and the MRI here is in a much lower age. If we do the sequencing by next generation sequencing, we can see that only 17% of the reads have this variant, whereas 50% 50, 50 are found in the in the sun where the, where the variant is fully penetrant. So in this case, where only some of the cells have the variant in the kidney, we can have this milder presentation of the disease. So uh, the specific gene and the pathogenic variant can also provide some information, prognostic information about how severe the disease is going to be in this particular patient. Uh, we know that there is a lot of different variants that cause uh, ADPKD. This is just a, uh, an image of the PKD1 gene here, the, the messenger RNA and the gene itself. And G, uh, variants of all different types can cause uh, polycystic kidney disease. And I'll show you in a minute what these variants mean. Uh, no single change accounts for uh, more than 2% of a uh, family. So we don't have a common variant that's causing polycystic kidney disease pretty much in every popula any population. And in the database, we have over 1,650 uh, variants to PKD1 that we think are, are pathogenic. So this is showing you the truncating types of variants. So we can have a deletion of say a single nucleotide here, and this shifts the code. So frame shifting. And this means that after this point, uh, only an, uh, a, a protein that's non-functional is, is, is generated. Here to stop the pro normally stop the protein, we have particular stop codons, but sometimes these can be uh, inserted uh, aberrantly in the middle of the protein. So these truncate the protein again. So we have, a, uh, again, a way of truncating the protein. And also if we change these little splicing nucleotides at the end of the introns, we can find that these also can cause um, uh, changes where parts of the intron, for instance, can be incorporated into the gene and they have a detrimental effect. The other types of changes we have are ones that keep making a full length protein, but the protein has a mistake in it. Missense is where we substitute one amino acid for another amino acid. And if this is an important part in the gene, it can mean 
uh, in the protein. It can mean that the protein doesn't function properly. And often it means it doesn't fold up and get to the right place properly. Likewise, because it's a three letter code, if we have a deletion of three letters, we can delete one uh, amino acid. And so now the protein will be shorter by this one amino acid. And if this is in a, a key part of the, the protein, this can also uh, cause a, a, a disease situation. You've probably heard that uh, the size of the kidneys in ADPKD are an indicator of how the severe the disease is going to be. And there's this Mayo imaging class that we developed a number of years ago, dividing the size of the kidney into five groups here with the, the largest one E and the smallest one A. And the work that Maria Arazabel did at that time, she was able to show that patients with larger kidneys were more likely to um, reach end stage renal disease or decline in EGFR more quickly than patients with smaller kidneys, which have more conserved function. We've just done a, a follow-up study of, of this and looking at different genotypes that we published last year. So this is a Kaplan-Meier uh, curve. This is showing uh, kidney survival. So the chance that uh, your kidneys will still be working and the age here of the patient. And you can see, depending on the type of variant you have, uh, influences how severe the disease is going to be. If it's a truncating mutation to PKD1, you can see that uh, uh, patients have a declining or uh, require uh, dialysis and transplant at an earlier age, so 55.3 years on average. It, whereas pre-KD2 patients over here, the average age of... Uh, of, of renal failure is 74 years. And non-truncating changes, these are the, the missense substitutions. We divided these into two groups, which are into, uh, in the middle of between the truncating PKD1 and PKD2. And if we look at the imaging classes, we can also see that that's predictive of how quickly uh, uh, the patient will require dialysis or transplantation. For the very largest kidneys, you can see the average age at renal failure is 45, whereas for P uh, the smallest kidneys, 1A, few patients reach renal failure. And you can see that the other groups fit in, in, between, in between those. We can also see that this genetic information and imaging information can give an idea of uh, how the decline in kidney function is going to occur. If we have truncating mutations, we can see that there's a decline in kidney function that's uh, measurable from quite early on and is fairly linear. Um, but if we look at in situations where we have a milder phenotype, we can see that the, 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 the renal um, um, function is preserved for many years, and then we only see a decline later on. So this will be similar in PKD2 and in patients with uh, smaller kidneys, whereas ones with larger kidneys, similar to the PKD1 truncating, and although even steeper, tend to uh, start showing a decline in renal function at an earlier age. So one other thing about genetic testing is it enables us to identify situations where we have uh, something different from the normal monoallelic inheritance, where we just have one variant, the dominant disease I showed you uh, early on. And in this case, we, um, we have a complicated situation where uh, individuals in the family only develop uh, ADPKD if they have two copies uh, of the variant. So they're, uh, in this case, homozygous or biallelic. This is of, in this family, uh, there was consanguinity, so uh, they were first cousins. And we can see that the patients with the two variants uh, have large kidneys and reached renal failure whereas one that only had one of these variants did occasionally develop cysts, but not enough to develop a renal failure. 
And this is uh, showing you that this is a conserved position uh, within, the, within the protein. Rarely in ADPKD, we can get uh, a very severe disease similar to the infantile disease that we see in the recessive form of polycystic kidney disease. And one way we can get this is if uh, uh, a normal variant, a normal truncating variant, as we see here, which is transmitted with the disease in the other members of the family, is joined by another uh, variant. In this case, the same one I showed you in the last family, <clears throat> this hypomorphic variant. And the combination of these can make a, a very severe form uh, of the disease can, that can even be recognized in, in utero. So these unusual presentations are important to, uh, uh, to get to the bottom of and doing genetic testing uh, is, a, is a way of finding out what the, the cause of this severe disease is. Uh, and the last example I, I want to uh, show you here is in the future, uh, the particular variant that causes the disease in your family uh, may be also provide uh, a specific treatment option. So uh, you've probably heard of this ideal of a personalized medicine where medicine is more geared to the particular uh, patient. One thing that we've been doing to evaluate variants is to be do using an in vitro assay system. So in this case, we uh, take cells from, a, from a, a kidney. We can grow these cells. Then we introduce into the kidneys uh, the PKD1 and the PKD2 gene with tags on them so that we can follow them. We then uh, use a, a flow cytometer to, to look at <clears throat> the expression of the PKD1 and PKD2 uh, proteins within the uh, um, within the cell. And we find that only cells that have PKD1 and PKD2 together express properly and express on the surface of the cell. And we can put variants into PKD1 and PKD2, and then we can see how does this influence this surface localization of the protein. And over here is a graph of these results. <clears throat> these are a number of different variants. This here is the normal gene. So we're seeing 100% of surface localization. But over here, we can see that we're getting very little surface localization. And these are mainly missense changes. So these are changes in the protein, uh, non-truncating changes, but ones we think influence the way the protein folds up and traffics. At this end, we can see that we have much milder variants. So these variants are not likely to be disease causing or not likely to be fully penetrant. So we result in the milder disease. Another thing we can do here is to do this experiment at a different temperature or a, a lower temperature. And we can find that some of these variants then uh, the surface localization is recovered. And this is showing us that, um, that they're, they're folding variants and under the right conditions, they, we may be able to make them fold better, which might be a future uh, treatment option. In cystic fibrosis, these types of uh, variant specific or allele specific treatments are now uh, being used in the, the clinic quite successfully. And there's a number of different types of these uh, treatments associated with particular variants. <clears throat> One is uh, suitable for nonsense mutations. These are the truncating mutations that put in the premature stop codon. These account for an, about a quarter of PKD1 uh, patients. And we can use uh, read-through drugs here uh, which then insert uh, an amino acid in this position and allow the protein to continue on. So these are still in experimental stages and 
not being used that much for, for therapy right now, but they are potentially a therapy that may be helpful for generating full length protein, even if there's this, this truncating mutation. The treatments that have been working very well in ADPKD are called potentiators or correctors. So the correctors um, um, work on variants that don't fold up and then don't traffic to the cell surface very well. And I to told you already that we think a lot of the in-frame missense changes are of this type where the protein doesn't transport properly to the surface. So the type of um, correctors that have been de developed for CFTR or probably will need to be developed specifically for the polycystins may be useful drugs. Potentiators are one where the protein um, uh, traffics properly, but then it doesn't work properly. And we think a minority of missense changes in ADPKD probably are like this. So again, we would need to develop specific potentiators for uh, the polycystin proteins, but this is still also a possible treatment option for the future. So uh, clinical genetic testing for ADPKD has become much more available in the last uh, three or four years. I think this is a good type of genetic testing to get if it's possible to get it because it can be then used uh, particularly uh, specifically and straight away to, um, for, to uh, make clinical decisions from. Now many different companies order, uh, offer genetic testing for ADPKD uh, in the United States. Here's just a few of them. <clears throat> These are using next generation sequencing approaches, usually, although sometimes there's backup because of the duplication of the BKD1 gene. This is much cheaper than it used to be, maybe around $1,000. And often medical insurance will uh, pay for this testing uh, now. <clears throat> so the out of pocket cost may be uh, nothing or a small amount. Once the variant in the family that's causing the disease is known, it's straightforward to test other members of the family. Um, you might think that doing genetic testing is going to give you a definite result in every case, but um, as with many things in life, it's not always quite so straightforward. Uh, sometimes we get uh, variants of uncertain significance and these are variants that might be important, but we don't know if they're definitely disease causing. And we can use a number of databases and, and tools to try and work out if a variant is significant. We can look at population, um, large populations that have been sequenced of normal individuals and see if the variant's present. We don't, wouldn't expect to find the variant present at a high level. It's gonna be a pathogenic change. We can look in repositories of uh, pathogenic variants, such as the um, PKD Foundation database of ADPKD. We can use these prediction tools to see if a substitution, for instance, is likely to be pathogenic, and likewise for variants that we think may be ultra splicing. We can look for larger deletions or insertions. And now there's guidelines for how we should assess these tools and what group that we should finally put these uh, variants in. And then we, these are reviewed by a group of experts to, uh, before the report is, is made to the, to the patient. We uh, published an editorial in uh, Kidney International recently outlining, the, outlining the, the system we have at Mayo for doing clinical uh, testing where the patient is counseled before the testing about the uh, negative as well as positive uh, aspects of, of genetic testing. The testing is ordered, the results are obtained, they're evaluated by the genomic experts. We have a meeting with all of these different people. Then we decide how this variant is going to be uh, reported and it's reported back with again counseling for the, for the patient. And then we can determine whether testing other family members may be of use. And if the situation is not fully resolved, maybe for more further follow-up research would be helpful. 
This is the, a summary of the database at, uh, or the version that we're updating right now. Over 3,000 variants in this database, 2,900 odd to P81, 353 to P82. The likely pathogenic changes over 1,900 overall, as I mentioned before, 1,650 to P81, about 250 to P82. In the database, we try to score these variants to determine whether we think they're pathogenic and then put them in these pathogenic groups, as I just showed you. So we're actually developing a new version of the database right now. Uh, the old version was not really compatible with uh, industry standards for safety. And so we've had to uh, re-engineer the, the database. And this is the front page of the database. And this is the type of information we get in the database. So it's just a listing of information of each of the variants that have been described in ADPKD, whether they're the type of change, whether they're truncating or non-truncating and the specific change, whether we think they're pathogenic or benign or lightly pathogenic, um, and in some cases, VUSs. Uh, and then more information about where they've, they've been uh, published. We have a back page, the database here, which shows more information uh, about the, the variant here. And in this particular variant has been classed as one of these variants of uncertain significance. And there's some comment here uh, about this particular uh, variant. We're um, further updating the database and adding some new information into the database. And we can show you uh, here, this is a variant we were continued, uh, considered as a variant of uncertain significance. One thing that we're trying to do is put in data about how commonly this uh, variant is found in this population of normal uh, individuals here and then also trying to determine whether it might be a, a fully penetrant uh, variant. You can see on the back page, uh, we've added additional information about where in the genome the variant is. And this is helpful for researchers to take uh, information out of their whole exome sequence, for instance, and determine uh, where it is exactly. We can also, and we're also adding this data from, from NOMAD, as I mentioned. And the, in the database, uh, this is the part we're working on now is this American College of Medical Genetics classification, determining whether what, what group it uh, fits into and what uh, pieces of information come forward with that. And this is the other scoring system that we've been using up to now to determine whether we think a variant is pathogenic and uh, how penetrant that variant might be. So I hope what I've uh, told you today has been of some value. Uh, ADPKD is mainly caused by pathogenic variants to uh, PKD1 and PKD2, but there are some other genes that have been identified, GANAB, DNA, JB11, ALG8, LALG9 can also cause ADPKD, although they only account for a small fraction of the total cases. Clinical genetic testing is now widely available, affordable, and often covered by insurance. Uh, the gene causing ADPKD and the type of pathogenic variant can be um, identified, uh, and the family testing can then be easily performed. This genetic information has both diagnostic and uh, prognostic uh, value. Uh, and in the future, this genetic information might highlight new treatment options, this personalized medicine. Uh, the ADPKD uh, variant database helps to interpret this genetic data, so it makes it easier for uh, labs around the world to determine whether a variant is really causing the disease or might be benign. This, uh, this uh, uh, lists uh, previously described variants and an interpretation of them, and um, 
identifies. It also is helpful for identifying patients for other genetic studies. And we used uh, patients in the database for an adp e modifier study. So this is a, an ongoing study where we're trying to find variants uh, outside of the PKD genes that might be uh, modifying the severity uh, of the disease. Uh, we also do research testing here at, uh, at Mayo um, in my lab. Um, I think the research testing is not the first thing that uh, a patient should do, because I think the clinical testing is, is uh, more, is, is done in a timely way and also um, can be used directly to make clinical uh, decisions. However, uh, there are times when the research testing can be helpful. For instance, if the cl clinical testing does not identify the cause of PKD or uh, it identifies a variant of unknown significance, following up with research testing or uh, evaluating the results from the clinical testing may be helpful. And I can certainly help uh, uh, with that. Um, it can help to identify other genes that might be causing ADPKD uh, because we put uh, additional genes that haven't been associated with ADPKD on, on the panel. And we've also used it to characterize clinical populations such as HALT, CRISP, TAME, TEMPO, Reprise. Uh, so it gets more, we get more information about those out of those studies by knowing what the, the cause of the disease are. So I just wanted to acknowledge the people that uh, helped to build and update and um, um, evaluate the variants in the database. So uh, Sarah Sinem, Holly Denza, and then Cynthia Seaman. She recently um, obtained a, a fellowship from the PKD Foundation, and she's been working on the in vitro variant evaluation system uh, that I showed you. So uh, thank you uh, for listening to me today. And uh, um, I hope you can uh, send me questions if you have, uh, you have uh, questions and I'll be happy to answer them. And, and if you have queries about particular variants or are interested in research testing, we'd also be happy to hear from you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Um, also, for anyone who attended our PKD Con in June, uh, we did feature Dr. Stephen um, in one of our research sessions, so check it out. Um, like Dr. Harris said, if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to submit them um, to research at pkdcure.org. And on behalf of everyone at the foundation, thank you so much for joining us and have a great day. Thanks, everyone.